Powered by MPB, this is Chalkboard Chat, an MPB education podcast. Hosted by Jermaine Flood and Tara Wren. To hear this episode and more, visit education.mpbonline.org or download the MPB public media app to listen on your iPhone or Android device. chalkboard chat this is our mississippi prison education and re-entry episode i am so excited to be able to have this subject on the table or on the slate rather for chalkboard chat and in with me right now i have mississippi humanities council assistant director carol anderson and the project coordinator for prison education with the humanities council miss carla faulkner welcome to chalkboard chat thank you, thank you. glad You're, to be here yeah, i'm glad to have you all right now i wanted to go ahead and get started with the Humanities Council major grant I want to congratulate you on. This is the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation grant to support humanities education in Mississippi prisons. Now, this $375 grant, part of the foundation's The Future of Higher Learning in Prison program, supports humanity courses taught by Heinz Community College, Northeast Mississippi Community College, and the Mississippi Delta Community College for the next two years as part of a new community college prison education consortium. Now, Ms. Carol Anderson, tell me a little bit about, one, how this came about, and I know you've been doing it for some years at MHC, but how this came about and basically what was the passion behind implementing this in such a way to make it work for the prison? Well, the Humanities Council has supported educational programming inside facilities, prison facilities in our state for several years starting with creative writing courses that we supported, theater arts courses. These were not for credit, but they had solid humanities content with writing and theater that made them eligible for our grants program. So we first started funding these projects through grants. Mm -hmm. As the years went on, we could see immense value in doing this work inside the prisons. Also, I want to mention that we were reaching an audience that we had never reached before. So the Humanities Council, we attempt to reach everybody all across the state with our programming and with our grants. Our tagline, in fact, is the humanities are for everyone. Yeah. So we were especially happy to be able to reach that audience that we could not reach in any other way. Eventually, we saw that the grant requests were the same year after year after year, so we made a decision to fund these projects directly. That carried on for a few years, and one of our grantees came to us with a proposal that would be supported by another funder, along with our support, to offer the first, for us, the first four credit courses in partnership with Heinz Community College. Mm -hmm. So we went down that road. We got in touch with the administration at Heinz Community College and talked with them about their interest in working with our grantee to offer humanities courses for credit. So our grantee would coordinate the instruction and Heinz Community College would admit the students and award the credits. Right. It has just grown from there. In December of 2020, Mm -hmm. we learned of the opportunity with Mellon Foundation to apply for, um, for us, a much larger uh, chunk of money to really go, go big with this project. So we really didn't have a lot of confidence that we would get that grant because, you know, we in Mississippi are still kind of relatively new at this compared to some other states. So we did go ahead and apply and we got funded. The project, as you may have read, is it really is a partnership between the Mississippi Humanities Council, the Mississippi Community College Board, and those community colleges where the courses are happening. So, And with the Department of Corrections, they are really an important player in this as well. So right. it, uh, it takes a team. Yeah, definitely takes the team. And we are ha, probably the weak link in all of this because we don't <laughs> teach and we don't award credits. But what we are good at is bringing people and organizations together toward a mission or a project that we think fits with our mission, which is to serve the citizens of Mississippi through the humanities. A liaison of sorts. Yeah. When it comes down to the actual credits that are received when they take these courses, do they end up having in the end degrees that they'll obtain as well? Ms. Carla, can you speak on that? Right. At this moment, 
we are not at the point, none of the schools are at the point of giving degrees yet. Okay. We see that coming, though. And by July of 2023, all students who are incarcerated will once again be eligible for Pell Grants. And I say once again because back in the 90s, Mm -hmm. they could get Pell Grants, and then that was eliminated. Congress finally started that back up. So once they have that, they'll be able to get a full course. But it's also true that, I mean, they're getting credits from Mm -hmm. Mississippi Community Colleges that will transfer to any other community college, will transfer to the senior colleges in the state. So while it may not be yet where they can walk out with a degree, they can walk out with credits that count towards that degree. Right. So in turn, eventually in the future, once they get released, they'll be able to make that work for their degree of choice. And I think within a few years, we're going to see it. Students are actually earning those associates in In prison. prison. In prison. Does that happen? And this is a side question. Do you happen to know if that happens in any other state where they actually? Oh, okay. Okay. So we're we're actually behind. Right. So the conception, Carol, I don't know if you had spoke on that. Were you here for the conception of this program or of you all working with incarcerated individuals education wise? Yes. So when you all started this, did you look at kind of what the other states were doing and try to mimic or pattern or anything off of them? Yes. So immediately when the opportunity to offer four credit courses with our grantee in partnership with Heinz Community College, with the help of the other funder I mentioned, we did begin to connect with other southern states that were offering four credit courses for incarcerated students. Tennessee particularly has a well-developed program. Alabama has some programming, so we definitely look to those other states, and particularly southern states, because I suspect that doing the work of educating students in prison probably works a little differently here than it does in other parts of the country, and Carla might be able to speak to that as well. Right. Have you seen any kind of how it works here, I guess, versus the other parts of the country, Ms. Carla? New York has a strong program that's been going on for a couple of decades, probably. Yeah. And so in New York, you see colleges that are offering not only associates, but bachelors. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage anybody that's interested in this work to watch the series College Behind Bars. And it was produced by Ken Burns, and it does an excellent job. And last I looked, it was available on Netflix as well as... As well as on PBS. <laughs> we know Ken Burns on PBS. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> when you said Ken Burns, that's what I was like, mm. <laughs> So we're now taking this on in the state. It's been a few years. There's a few different programs surrounding this. Tell me about, Carol, if you can, MCCB's role in what they do, Mississippi Community College Board, to help push this initiative along. Well, they have been invaluable to this process. So... As I said, the Humanities Council doesn't teach and doesn't award credits, so we immediately reached out to the Community College Board, both for their advice on the feasibility of developing programs and then also for connecting with these community colleges, working through all of the hoops and gates that we have to get through to get students enrolled, you know, to get their records for their placement Mm -hmm. um, um, Mm -hmm. testing. And we could not have done that without the Community College Board. We really needed their buy-in. They did give us their buy-in very quickly, but to connect with these community colleges in any meaningful way. Now, the community colleges do function independently, and they get to make their own decisions. So it's their choice if they want to be involved. And so far, we've seen very strong interest in this work. But it was very helpful to have the community college board guide us through this this, um, process. Right. I want to mention that we specifically connected with the community colleges first in this work because they're situated all around the state. Mm -hmm. All of them are within the vicinity of the correctional facilities around our state. So when a student leaves a correctional facility, you know, there is a location for them to continue pursuing their education pretty easily versus having to, you know, go farther afield to find, you know, another institution. So that network of community colleges made good sense to us as a starting point for getting students 
involved in continuing their education. Right. And speaking of that network, again, if you didn't hear me in the beginning, Heinz Community College is a part of this. Northeast Mississippi Community College is as well, in addition to Mississippi Delta Community College. They are, oh, no, Miss Carla, <laughs> tell me about Mississippi Delta Community College. I'm not, uh, Mississippi Delta Community <laughs> College, I can tell you a lot about, but I actually was going to tell you that our work is expanding to Jones College oh, okay. in the fall. Okay, so Jones College is added to this list as well. Mm-hmm. I am an alum of Heinz Community College, so I am very much involved and supportive of community college education. It's what kind of saved me. I wasn't the best student, but community college kind of like set me up for the next level, which was Mississippi College, but I needed kind of that that liaison in between. (laughs) And if that's true for you, think how true it is for students who are incarcerated. Right. Nationwide, less than half of students who are incarcerated have high school diplomas or a high school equivalency. So a lot of them are getting their high school equivalency while they are in prison, and then they are learning, oh, look what else I can do. Mm -hmm. I am totally capable of doing this college work and becoming productive, contributing members of society. And so this is transformative work, yeah. and it's transformative for these students, but it's also transformative for, I think, everybody who works with the program. Right, right. Does the professors come to the prisons to teach these courses, or is it virtual? How, how, what's, what's behind that? <laughs> well, the original plan was for all of the classes to be in the prison, taught in person. Okay. covid messed with that like it did everything else. Right. And so at Delta, who is teaching courses at Parchman, they are teaching remotely but synchronously. In other words, it's like a Zoom call. Okay. And so the students are sitting in a traditional classroom and there's a screen and the teacher's on it and they can communicate directly and immediately. Right. And so they do have to, you know, like have somebody scan papers back and forth. But other than that, it is a very traditional classroom. The teacher is there real time, but she is not in person. At Alcorn County Correctional Facility, they were able to get their students fully vaccinated very early. Mm -hmm. And so the teachers were able to go in face-to-face in a totally traditional environment. And so in our other schools, we will see how it plays out. Hines was able to start out that way to finish up courses. They will see what happens and whether they end up in a more remote setting. Okay, okay. But that's a COVID thing. Right, right. I would like to add at this point that that is the Mississippi Manny's Council's priority is to whenever possible, wherever possible, to have these courses conducted in person. Of course, COVID and other situations, maybe lockdowns, there may be things that prevent a teacher from getting in that requires a remote class. But our priority is always going to be, our emphasis is always going to be on that in-person experience just because we think it's it's so beneficial Mm -hmm. to the -hmm. the learning. Yeah. I mean, even aside of inmate learning, you know, I was speaking to children in Mississippi who say that they want to go back to school in person. So it's just not even, you know, just for them and like for everybody, everybody's kind of like this in-person thing is a real is a real thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people just learn better when they're sitting face to face with somebody. And that is our emphasis. I will have to admit, though, that those teachers at Delta made that remote synchronous learning work well. And when we had our completion ceremony and one of those teachers was able to meet those students in person, you could see the connection. You could see that they had made real person connections even over the screen. Right. Ms. Carla, now I wanted to talk about maybe the difference between learning in classroom and learning now in prison. Um, What's the differences maybe between what happens in a classroom and what happens in prison? And is there any resources that maybe they're lacking because we are in this prison setting? It is a different learning environment. The most important difference is that these students have no access to the internet 
at all. And so they can't do research on the Internet. They can't look up something. When they're writing a paper, they're writing it out by hand. And we've made sure, thanks to the Rotary Clubs of Jackson, that they have dictionaries because they've got to look up the spelling the old-fashioned way. Even in that classroom in Parchment where the teacher is there on screen, the students still don't have access to it. At Northeast, the two classes they were teaching, speech and history, the speech teacher used history topics for their speech topics so that they would have their textbook to use for research. They had a retired librarian, Miss Glennis Stone, who did research and printed up hard copies so the students would have that in their cells. Right. So that is really the biggest difference. And so in some of those classrooms, there's that old-fashioned chalkboard right. up there that the teacher is using. That's the way to pull it in. Now, when it comes down to I guess, you know, this aspect of them not having Internet, is this something that's normal inside of prisons? They don't yes. usually have Internet access. Right. Now, and this is a, something that we're seeing change in some states. Tennessee is using what they call intranet. Okay. So they can't connect with the whole wide world, world, world web. Yeah. web yeah. But they can at least communicate with the teacher. And some schools are doing secure servers, and again, so that they can communicate and get classroom material. In Mississippi right now, we're still completely old school with no internet uh, so at all. So when it comes the down prisons. to the video component aspect that you were speaking about earlier, so the the professor themselves from the community college is on site. They are, you know, they're at Mississippi Delta in their traditional classroom. Okay. It's kind of cool because they have their smart board behind them. So they can pull up things on the Internet. Right. But the students are sitting in a classroom, and they are just looking at the screen and seeing what the teacher has up there on the screen. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So this is not really intranet, but they're kind of being broadcast. Exactly. Okay, okay, I get it. I get it. Well, that is some good stuff, though, to know. I did not know that there was not internet access in prisons while we were talking about this whole subject. There are a lot of ways that they lack resources that a traditional student would have. They don't have access to their instructor just any old time they want. So they see their instructor once a week, maybe mm -hmm. twice a week, and no office hours in between. They can't email their instructor. They can't call or text their instructor. So those sorts of connections that you would have in a traditional setting are just not there. Right. The books, the libraries are limited. There are rules about what kinds of books even that they can have. Mm. I think no spiral and, bound, wire bound right, books. Nothing, nothing with wire. So you have to be careful about the type of writing utensils they use and yeah. the type of notebooks that mm. they use. And they often have to just look at a list of books and select books to be delivered to their cell as opposed to being able to browse in the library. But I've seen Mississippi Department of Corrections and Shanice Mabry work really hard to try to connect students with resources, even within the limitations that are required. And there is a support person that is there to help them. And particularly at Parchman, they've got really strong people that are there trying to provide support and answer students' questions. Even though we have to use some different uh, teaching methods with these students because they don't have access to the Internet, their course requirements, the course objectives, and what they have to do is exactly the same as what it would be on the main campus. Because when they leave and they want to transfer uh, Comp 1, they need to be ready for Comp 2, just like any other student. So the requirements are exactly the same as they are for all students. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, this sounds like a great program. I love the fact that we're even going old school with it. At, that lends its hand back to the chalkboard again. And that's what I wanted to know, too. Have you all seen any kind of success stories or people who have come out? And how do the inmates feel? Do they enjoy it? What's the, what's the general sense? We've just had one semester. 
But at the end of this first semester, students had to do evaluations, just like all student college students do. And when I read through those evaluations, I was overwhelmed. Their complaint was classes weren't long enough. We needed to meet more days of the week. This should have lasted more weeks. Right. They wanted more. Yeah. I have, you know, I've been in the classroom 40 years. I've seen evals for 30 years. I've seen very positive evals. And yet I don't know that I've ever seen consistently student after student who was so hungry for learning. Yeah. Yeah. The instructors also give evaluations to the Humanities Council about their experiences, and they, too, consistently discuss what a valuable experience it was. It's, you know, the desire to learn and the commitment to study and learn from those students is, it's more than they've ever experienced. Right. It's, you know, every teacher that we've ever worked with has said it was a life-changing kind of experience for, for them, them to be in, for the teacher to be in that kind of a role with that particular student audience. Right, right. And this, though, can even be a game changer for the inmates' future themselves. A hundred percent. So it's it's not just what they're learning from the books and the papers they're writing. It's the human relational skills that they're having a chance to either retain or build while they're there. So you think about that when you leave a facility, you are finally released, if you haven't had this kind of interpersonal experience to any great extent, it's going to be difficult to talk to a future potential employer or future potential landlord. These are incredible experiences and they're very important to their life when they leave beyond the the education that they have. Uh Yeah. Uh Keep in mind that the grant only funds humanities courses. Right. And so in studying those humanities courses, they are also discovering human dignity. And so many of them have had negative life experience Uh after negative life experience. Uh And then suddenly to dive into subjects that is talking about the value of man and their worth and the way we contribute and make a difference in life. It's life changing. They've learned soft skills. They've gained an appreciation for who they are and their human dignity. And it's part of what makes it such transformative work. That's some good holistic stuff right there. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. Now, I may back up just a little bit, but I wanted to talk about the council's education programs that I saw written, the two. That was the Prison to College Pipeline and the Prison Rights Initiative. I, either one, either Miss Carla or Miss <laughs> Carol. Oh, Miss Carol. <laughs> Carla's like, and this is Carol's corner. <laughs> but Carol, talk to me about maybe the prison to pipe, the prison to college pipeline, and the prison rights initiative a little bit. So the prison to college pipeline is a program created by two professors who, at the time it was created, they were teaching together, I believe, at the University of Mississippi, Dr. Patrick Alexander and Dr. Otis Pickett. Mm-hmm. They continue to operate this program together. It's humanities-centric teaching. Uh, they have a specific model of teaching. But, yes, they have taught at Parchment, and we we did not fund the courses at Parchment. The, we funded the courses that they taught through Mississippi College at Central Mississippi Correctional Facility for the, for the women there. Mm-hmm. They have, so they first came to us for grant support for those courses, and we have continued to support them and that work at Central Mississippi Correctional Facility once we stopped making them write grants, it's direct support. So we right. continue to support their work as well. I know they're working on fall courses for the women at Central. And the School of Liberal Arts at the University of Mississippi has supported the work at Parchman. So those have been for credit all along. Prison Rights Initiative, when I was describing for you the early non-credit work that we were supporting, that was through Prison Rights okay. Initiative. So those were the creative writing courses and the theater arts courses that were being taught. Creative writing was being taught first at Parchment and then later at Central Mississippi Correctional Facility and then at Alcorn County Correctional Facility. The theater arts were being taught at Marshall County Correctional Facility in Holly Springs. And I've had a chance to watch a lot of those programs in action. So they're not for credit, but they're incredible programs. The students in the creative writing courses start out by learning to read and interpret and discuss really pretty complex literature, you know, like 
Sartre and things like that. Yeah. And then they they go from there to learning to write memoirs. And those memoirs, with their permission, have been published in collections that you can buy. It's called In Their Own Words, Writing from Parchment Prison, I mm. think. Another one was published, the writings from the women in the program at Central Mississippi Correctional Facility. At the Alcorn County Correctional Facility, they actually in addition to the writing, they produced a theatrical production that they were allowed to present, I believe, in a county courthouse. So it was really impressive. Now, they couldn't have a public audience. I think there were a few guests who could come, but Mm -hmm. it was recorded. So it was really incredible. I saw the one at uh, several years ago that was presented at Marshall County Correctional Facility in Holly Springs. And it was August. And there must have been I'm guessing 300 men in the gymnasium watching this production on the floor. They play that these men had written about really their lives and how they wound up in the situations they are in, but through an experience in a barbershop. So Mm -hmm. it's centered in a barbershop. But as people come in and out of the barbershop, so they wrote this and they're acting out these life stories through this play in a barbershop. It was really remarkable. So from that, the Prison Rights Initiative did eventually connect with Heinz Community College briefly to work on four credit courses. COVID really put everything in disarray. So that has halted for now. But Right. And I can tell your passion behind it. So how great is it and what have you found to be the most rewarding from your work with education in Mississippi prisons? There, Carol, you first. Yeah, there are many yeah. things. I think so when we do humanities, when we support humanities programs for folks who are not incarcerated, Yeah, we know it's really valuable. We see they're happy with the programming. I know there's great value to it, but it's on a whole nother level when you watch people who are incarcerated interact with humanities programs who have very little opportunity to interact with programming of any kind. Mm -hmm. The appreciation of the humanities in that community is you cannot not see it. So I think that's what I get most excited about is seeing how reading literature, discussing philosophy, writing creatively, acting out theatrical productions that reflect life stories. It's wonderful to see. Right, right. Now, Miss Carla, you are stating that you have been in education for 40 years. Are you a former teacher? Yes. Yes, I taught at Northeast for 30 years. Okay, okay. So as a former teacher, what do you find to be the most passionate for you in working with this program? Well, it's just thrilling to see such hungry learners, <laughs> to see people that are so excited to be in a classroom and so appreciative. The other part, though, because, I mean, I'm not in the classroom with them now except as an, an occasional observer. So the other part is just how transformative I see this work. You know, students that do higher education in prison have a 48% reduced chance of recidivism. Mm -hmm. They create positive role models for younger members of their family, helping to create some of that incarceration cycle. They become contributing members of society, and as a result, it benefits the family, the community, and it is a investment for taxpayers because taxpayers basically get back about $5 on every dollar that is spent in higher education okay. in prison. And students who are able to actually go on and earn their associates, their recidivism rate is only 14%. Those that go on and earn their bachelors, it's down to 5%. Yeah. So this is work that changes the individual, it can change the family, and have positive impacts on our whole society. Long term. This is long term impacts. Long term stuff. Great stuff. Now listen, if anybody needed maybe more information about Mississippi Humanities Council work with prison education, how can they contact the council? We do have a page on our website with some information about the program, www.mshumanities.org. 
but we're also happy to have them just contact us directly by phone. All of our contact information is on our website. So make sure you all go there. Again, this was my guest, Carol Anderson, Assistant Director for Mississippi Humanities Council, and Ms. Carla Faulkner, the Project Coordinator for Prison Education with the Mississippi Humanities Council. We were here talking about their major grant award from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to support humanities education in Mississippi prisons. Again, thank you both for joining me today. Eye-opening. I can feel the passion, and I know there is going to be success with this program and all the programs that come out of the Mississippi Humanities Council. So thank you both for joining us here on Chalkboard Chat. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you. Jermaine Flood in again for Chalkboard Chat. This is our Mississippi Prison Education and Reentry episode. I just got done talking with Carol Anderson, the Assistant Director at Mississippi Humanities Council, and Carla Faulkner, the Project Coordinator for Prison Education with the Mississippi Humanities Council. And in with me right now is one of the college administrators who administrated the higher education and prison curriculum. He is a Dr. Ben Cloyd of Mississippi Delta Community College. He is the Vice President for Effectiveness and Enrollment there. Dr. Cloyd, welcome to Chalkboard Chat. Well, thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. Oh, thank you so much for joining us. I cannot wait to get into this conversation. This topic is something that I've been super interested in since I started the podcast last year, and I'm just so glad I get to tap on it a little bit. When it comes down to that, how did Mississippi Delta Community College get involved with offering this curriculum, and how were you chosen for it, or did you choose it yourself? Well, really, Jermaine, that kind of predated my arrival at Mississippi Delta Community Mm -hmm. College. I started at the college about one year ago, and actually several months prior, the college had already entered into an agreement with the Mississippi Humanities Council, the wonderful partners there that are helping to provide some funding to allow us to teach a few classes, humanities classes, at Parchman. So that was all supposed to start, I think, in the spring of 2020. And, of course, the spring of 2020, as everybody knows, was when the world went beyond oh, crazy. Right. So everything was sort of put on pause. And then I arrived in the summer of 2020 at Mississippi Delta Community College, and there was, was already a great team. We have a wonderful vice president of instruction, Teresa Webster. We have dean of enrollment and over admissions, Dean Jay Gary. There are a lot of people who are already involved and excited about this project when I got there. And then we just worked really hard in the middle of the pandemic to try to figure out, hey, we're already providing, you know, instruction in new ways to students. Isn't this still a really good time to try to forge ahead and help, you know, great students at at Parchman? And so that's what we started working on. We didn't do it alone. We had tremendous support, as I already mentioned, from Mississippi Humanities Council, from Stuart and Carol and Carla, of course. We had the great support from Shanice Mabry, who is the statewide director of education for MDOC. She is incredible and has been always there to help us open doors and answer questions so that we could, you know, make contacts at Parchman. We've had the support from Commissioner Kane on down. There's a great superintendent there. Mr. Morris is at Parchman. He's been kind of instrumental in helping us get in. And then I'm, I'm thinking of like, you know, Nate Murphy, who helps kind of oversee the, the rooms and make sure we have the technology in place so that we can work with students in the classrooms at Parchment. I mean, it, it just goes on and on. You know, everybody has been flexible and supportive. It's been a true team effort. You know, I should also say the, the good folks at the Mississippi Community College Board have been wonderful. They have actually helped us to really find ways to smooth some of the paperwork that can be the biggest challenge in all of this, trying to merge the two bureaucracies of, you know, correctional bureaucracy and educational bureaucracy can be daunting, but trying to smooth the way, for example, MCCB has helped us get high school transcripts, high school equivalencies for inmates so that we can have that documentation and we can officially have students on the books Mm -hmm. and to include them in our audits and to to get the, the reimbursement for them as students, as they deserve to be. So that's been hugely important. So really, it, it's been the story of, I would say, really four major agencies. You know, if you count MDOC and the Mississippi Humanities mm-hmm. Council, and you count, you know, us as a, as a college, and then you count MCCB, you know, it, it's really taken four major agencies who have just been willing to listen to each other, be proactive in working on solutions. And this is all to get instructors to the starting line 
so that we can work with classes of students. And we were able to do that successfully in this past spring of 2021. And so we, in the spring of 21, we actually offered three different sections. We ended up having about 25 students at Parchman. Mm -hmm. Uh, Our instructors were remote. We have a technology called Swivel. Mm. And what that technology allows our instructors to do is to be in their classroom so they can use the classroom, internet, chalkboards, slash whiteboards, and they can teach their class. And then the students can actually be off-site, in this case at Parchman, and have access to watching. And and it's a two-way deal. They can ask questions and and participate. So you get a lot of the benefits of what you would have in a face-to-face setting but also the advantage of being remote, which, of course, was so important when during that time when we we're all very much focused on safety and trying to make sure that, that we were responsible to each other during the pandemic. Right. Let's talk about a little. I wanted, I'm going to come back to the remote aspect of it all, but I want to talk about the curriculum. Sure. Does the curriculum pertain to humanities courses in general? Is that all of the curriculum there? Yes. Right now, what we're at this current point, we were approved for funding for three courses from the Mississippi Humanities Council. So we started in the spring with three English courses. Mm -hmm. So we had three, we kind of have a stepping stone at the community college level of, you know, English Composition 1, of course, is the mainstay. But there are also some preparation courses. We have a beginning English course and an intermediate English course. And so we offered one of each of those sections, so beginning English and intermediate English and then English Composition 1. And so those are the three sections that we put in the spring. We're actually working on the course sequence for this fall. We're in the process of having students, you know, admitting students and having students apply and setting up the class schedule for this fall coming. And we'll start to branch out this fall. We haven't, we don't have a final determination yet on what those courses will be. But again, we're going to have a mix of humanities courses. But there, we had a good meeting just a few weeks ago. and, And really, at this point, we're excited about kind of expanding well beyond English and to explore as much of the humanities as possible. And then, you know, now that we've got that baseline in place and we're, we're kind of learning how to help students get admitted, working through the paperwork, which we've kind of gone on fashion. We, we go up there and we collect applications on paper and mm-hmm. we, we just kind of get there and do what we need to do to make it happen. And, but, yeah, at this point we're looking forward to expanding into more of the humanities classes and eventually beyond. You know, the, the, the long-term goal, certainly from Mississippi Delta Community College's perspective, is to – walk with students all the way from the start of their college careers to potentially graduation with an associate of arts degree. That'll take, you know, many years of work, but we've got, I think we've got the team in place and we've got the connections and, and most importantly, the goodwill and teamwork across the state. I think everybody sees that common vision of what this really means for students. And that means, you know, kind of life-changing access to education. Right. Now, Doc, were you one of those um, administrators who were holding class? Did you actually teach class? I did not teach, no. Um, I, I used to be a history teacher long ago, but mm-hmm. they, uh, apparently I didn't do a good enough job. <laughs> they, they booted me behind the desk to answer phones and send emails. Uh but no, I have not yet had the chance. I mean, I ho- I'd love to teach a history class at some point to some of these fine students. But no, I, I was not one of the teachers. These were English teachers from uh, Mississippi Delta Community College who spoke. Okay, okay. And were you able to maybe gauge kind of what, you know, they were doing in class? Were you, Have you been able to kind of view or see any of that? I've not actually witnessed any of it. I did okay. just about a week or so ago. Well, actually, maybe about 10 days ago or so. I had a really great conversation with one of our English instructors, uh, Elizabeth Melton, who mm-hmm. is a, one of the – and I'm not saying that to slight the other two. They did a fabulous job. As no. Well. But I saw her, I saw her at, a, at an event on campus, and I think she was still just kind of coming down from the high almost of what the experience had been like this spring. She, yeah. she was just so thrilled with – how well it had gone. There were some technology challenges, of course, at first, but we, we navigated through those and was just really deeply moved, I think, by the depth of the relationships, the quality and spirit of the students. You know, it was funny. I did read all the evaluations that students wrote about the classes, and by far the most common complaint about the classes mm-hmm. was, that, was that the classes were simply too short. <laughs> um, these, were, these classes were two hours long, uh, yeah. and yet the students said they were too short. And I think we all you know, on the academic side, we all laugh. You know, you don't usually hear from students complaining that the classes are ending, but these students certainly did. So the overwhelming response has been very positive. Students have been deeply grateful and have risen to the challenge. Our instructors have, my hat is fully off to them for being willing to take on, you know, just another level of remote instruction in the middle of all the other remote instruction stuff that's been going on, you know, just because of, of the pandemic. It's been a lot of people willing to extend themselves and go above and beyond because they believe deeply in 
really what community colleges are about and what the power of education is about. Right, right. Now, getting back to the remote question, I was going to ask, is there any plans? Now, I knew you were saying y'all kind of went a little bit more traditional when it came down to the application process. Was that kind of an a face-to-face deal there? Yeah, our registrar, as I mentioned, Jay Gary, you know, our not dean of enrollment management, our registrar, he goes in person. You know, it, it's you know about a forty minute time, mm-hmm. so he goes up there as needed. And we have kind of a multiple parts that we need from an admissions process. We obviously need students to fill out an application so they can. We go up there, we do that on paper, and then we also have kind of a placement testing that student that helps us kind of see where students you know should should fall in terms of which classes would be appropriate, and that's called AccuPlacer. So we, we do that on paper as well. So we try to, you know, kind of cut out some of the, the technology and things that can be a challenge to make it as easy as possible for accessibility. You know, we want as many students as, as we can you know, possibly you know, accommodate in three sections. Of course, you can't serve everybody with three sections, but we can try to, to do what we can. Yeah. And so, yeah, we do admissions and kind of testing work on paper. And like I said, in the spring, we had remote instruction through the swivel we feel like we've got that worked out pretty well, and mm-hmm. we're going to continue with that. Okay. Certainly for the fall, you know, for the foreseeable future, I think you know that may change down the line. But for now, we're going to just kind of stick with what's worked. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask. I was going to say, is there any plans down the line to take it face to face in class? But I mean, right now, the way the world is going with COVID and and everything else, I don't doubt people are just taking on this whole you know virtual aspect. You know full time from hence now forth and forever. <laughs> it's it's on I mean it's on everybody's mind how to make this program sustainable and most effective for students. We want to do what's right by students, we want to do what's right by the college and our teachers. And I think the nice thing about it is, you know, all those constituents I mentioned have come to the table. The relationship there is strong and there's a lot of trust and goodwill there that we're just going to talk each semester about how to make it better and do what is the best thing for students. I mean, that's really what we're what we're committed to doing as a team. Right. Now, Doc, tell me about your involvement in this program. What exactly did you do inside of your position to help with this program? So my role in this, you know, as the, the vice president for kind of the enrollment piece, one of the areas under me is the admissions and, you know, financial aid side of the house at the college. Mm-hmm. So my role specifically was on the application and admission side of things, looking at what can we do to officially enroll these students and make sure we can count them when it comes time for our audit, you know, for statewide purposes. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of back of the house kind of stuff. And so that's really what I kind of challenged our team, not challenged because they didn't need a poking or anything, (laughs) but just to just to kind of remind ourselves, hey, our mission is to be accessible to students and do all we can to have students of all types at Mississippi Delta Community College. So that was really my role was to make sure we were doing all that we could to remove any kind of hurdles and logistical challenges that would keep students out of the college. And then we worked very closely, as I said, with Teresa Webster, our vice president of instruction, you know, on the class offerings that would be appropriate. And then, as I said, get back into the rest of the the team there or the Mississippi Humanities Council that helped us secure some of the funding and so on. And so, yes, but now my role specifically was, hey, these students want to go to school. It's really important that they go to school because many of them are, you know, fathers and have kids that are thinking about going to college. You know, just the, the coolness of, hey, look, I'm doing this and, you know, setting the example and achieving dreams. You know, a lot of times I think, you know, those dreams may seem unattainable, but I, there's a real responsibility for us to do all we can to bring college and real college level work to all students. And that's what it's about. Yeah, all students, not just the ones that are out on the outside, but also right. the ones that are in prison. So I, I, would just add, oh, I, that's, I would just add, these, these students are incredible. We, we had a great ceremony at the end of the semester. Several of them read essays on what the experience had meant to them. The quality of work is fantastic. The dedication of these students is fantastic. It couldn't have been a better experience for what the instructors are saying, for what the students are saying, from what the staff at Parchman and Ms. Mabry are saying. And everybody is just deeply impressed with what the potential of this means. Right. Last question. I wanted to know if somebody out there maybe has a family member or somebody they know, a friend or somebody who's incarcerated, is there any way, especially if they're sitting there thinking, I wonder if my family member would like to go through the program while they're in, is there any way that they can get in contact or get that information to somebody who is in prison? 
That's a really good question. You know, we're deeply respectful of the fact that Parchman, like any correctional facility, has got its own infrastructure and leadership, yeah. and it's got its own, you know, you know, it's got its own culture. You know, it's got its own uh, heartbeat, so to speak. We work really closely with Nathaniel Murphy, and so I think Mr. Murphy is does a fabulous job for us as sort of helping us kind of identify mm-hmm. who are the right mixes and fits. But I would just say to anybody that's thinking about, hey, this is out there, by all means, have people speak up. You know, right now we've got three classes, but we're looking to continue to do this consistently. Three classes a semester over time as it adds up can really take you far. And this mm-hmm. is transferable college credit that mm-hmm. will certainly carry on with you when you when you come out and you're released. You can continue on to school and get your education. Or if you're going to be inside for some time, keep keep taking those classes. You can move all the way towards graduation down the line. That's what we're working towards. But no, in, internally, we don't have the access mm-hmm. to be able to say, hey, there are X number of students at Parchman, and that screening is done internally by Parchman. So we're a little bit limited as far as that piece. Yeah. And I don't mean that as like a, any sort of, you know, denigration. That's no, just, no, no. It's just, just so many reality. bureaucracy stacked yeah. up. Yeah. So what it is, is, you know, that's where Shanice and Nathaniel Murphy and, and some of the great, you know, adult ed instructors at Parchman who are willing to kind of share their room with us. I mean, it's really a team effort at Parchman. Mm-hmm. So I would, I mean, if it's at all possible, I'd recommend, you know, trying to you know get somebody from their side to maybe help explain their process. But I don't, I couldn't fairly comment on. Yeah. Oh, in that process, um, how they do that. But I know they're very interested in, in in working. We had, like I said, we had about 25 students in the spring. We're shooting to have about 60 students this fall. So we're yes. trying to kind of really fill our class. We had the classes last semester. Now we want to kind of fill them. Yeah. And, we're, and then and then it's about continuing to offer a variety of classes to keep students moving forward and progressing towards a degree, and just sustaining and building the trust for students that we're going to be here for a while kind of get back to the question you asked just a minute ago i think for a lot of students and family members there's probably a lot of opportunities that come and then people kind of close up shop and move on to the next thing and it's sort of like well i'm not any closer to my goal than i was before and i think the number one challenge before certainly mississippi delta community college is to to kind of show hey this is these aren't just three classes this is a semester and a semester and a semester and really stack the opportunity for the long term Mm -hmm. for people and that that's what will carry weight and so i would say to anybody that's hearing this and is thinking let's get involved i'd say go for it you know we're going to continue to to look for applications we're going to continue to admit students and if you don't you know start this semester that's okay we'll be here next semester that's good work dr cloyd i thank you so much for the work you have done with mississippi delta community college in conjunction with mississippi community college board in conjunction with mississippi humanities council you all just do such great work and this work is so important because it really does set these people up for the outside life for outside world and getting them back on path of doing great things once they get out so thank you so much for your work in that It's been my pleasure today, and it's our pleasure to do this work. We believe in it. Yeah, thank you. Now, to my audience, that was Dr. Ben Cloyd. He is the Vice President for Effectiveness and Enrollment at Mississippi Delta Community College, and we were just talking about higher education in prison. That's help. He was the college administrator for that, and we thank him again for joining us here on Chalkboard Chat. This is Jermaine Flood. Class is now dismissed. been listening to Chalkboard Chat, an MPB education podcast. To hear this episode and more, visit education.mpbonline.org or download the MPB public media app to listen on your iPhone or Android.